This is for Tuesday, the 29th of September. We had left off with this slide right here. We know that during the Dark Age, the biggest threat to the various feudal systems were marauding Vikings. Now, a Viking is somebody who comes from the north, usually Denmark, Norway, Sweden, uh, Finland. They were great seafaring powers, and they would come into the lands, and they would take whatever they could. Now, if you wanted to avoid the punishment, you could offer the Vikings a sum of money or food or something that would be called tribute. Now, if tribute is not in your term sheet, it's something that you need to put in. The Vikings were not the only people who are causing mischief. There are the Magyars and the Moors. Now, a third of you will have to write a report about Vikings, Magyars, and Moors. Make sure you know where they come from, why they were so successful, and I guess, why did they die out? Well, in the Dark Ages, we have an economic system called feudalism. Now, to protect themselves from the Vikings, the leader, the king, would give land to the people who would live on it. Now, the person who would live on this land would be called a vassal, and the land itself would be called a fief. So if I was the king and I gave you a piece of land, the land is called the fief, and you become the vassal. Now, on your land are going to be people, and these people are called serfs. Now, every vassal had serfs, and the serfs came with the land. Feudalism drew from what we would call Germanic customs. One of the beliefs was that the leader should be a warrior, that the leader should be trained in the art of combat that he would select others to aid him in battle, and these others were called knights. Now, to hone their skills, they would have competitions. And in these competitions, there would be sword fights, and there would be joust with lances. Warriors were expected to maintain a particular code, what we call a code of chivalry. Now, chivalry required for them to be brave, required for them to protect and defend women and children, and to exhibit Christian values. Church lands would also be defended by knights. The Knights Templar would be a very good example of an order of knights that just controlled the land of the, of the church. Many knights would fight to the death, and the victor was a result of God's will. Here's a short video about chivalry. Um, again, we can't show it because uh, it would probably get this one banned by YouTube. So we shall move on. Feudal homes were almost always built to become fortified. Now they were made of stone so that it would be, you could not burn them down. The castles contained running water and food for the leader, the knights, and the serfs who might make it into the castle before the bad people uh, could come and stop it. Castles were always placed in locations with unlimited sight. You want to see your enemy coming. The walls were made in such a way that it would be very difficult for the walls to be overcome by a ladder. And if the bad people put a ladder up, you could always push the ladder down. The castles were run by a steward. Now the steward might be related to the vassal, and then again he might not. The steward runs the day-to-day -day operations. This way the leader can train for the art of combat. The vassal's wife was, had responsibilities as well. Each of the castles had a garden, and the garden was the domain of the castle's wife. These gardens were supervised by servants. Uh, there were people to cook the meat. There were people to clean. There were people to do any job in a castle. This person was always supervised by the wife. And in many cases, the wife took over for the finances to make sure that 
the castle was being run efficiently. Now, women had no rights. Even the women who were related to the vassal had no rights. Women were always married off young, around 13 or 14, and this was done to cement alliances with the leaders of other duchies that might be close. Childbirth was incredibly hard on women, and so women did not live very long. Many times the Lord, the vassal, might have several wives in the course of his life. The land, the leader, the land was called a manor. So the crops that were going to grow are going to be grown on a fief. But if we put the castle and the fief and all the other buildings, this is called the manor. Now work, the, the workers called serfs could not leave the manor. So you, the serfs owed the, the leader money, and the money was never re, the money could never be repaid. Now the serf would receive housing, and he would owe the leader goods and services. Now if there was any food left over, that went to the serfs, but that was usually precious little. The church also had manners. The church's manners had serfs. The church's services were also owned by religious leaders. So let's say that you're a serf and you are on a church manor. Then you would grow crops and the crops would be given to the leader of the church, maybe a bishop or something like that. Or maybe you would have some type of a supervisor. Now the land, the fief itself, was broken into small patches. And these small patches were subdivided into something called a two field system. Now in year one you would grow crops on field one and you would let field two go farrow. Farrow means all you would do is, is grow grass. And then the next year you would switch them up. The one that had grown grass you would grow crops on them. The other one you would, you would allow it to grow grass. The hope was that this year on year off the ground would be full of nutrients. Remember, they didn't have fertilizers like they do today. Serfs also had skills besides farming. The serfs may have been taught to be a carpenter. The serfs may have been taught to be a mason. That's somebody who works with stone. Or a metal worker. Now these skills were beneficial to the vassal. And the vassal many times would allow the the carpenters or masons or metal workers to maybe not work as hard as the farmers did. At least there would be some downtime. Now, of course, farming out in the field was quite difficult. And the work would be very long and demanding. The homes of the serfs provided by the leaders were very simple. Whether you are a farmer or you are a mason or you are a metal worker, Probably your home is going to have one or two rooms. The serfs ate what they could. Meat was considered a luxury. So you might go days and days and days and days without eating meat. Life expectancy was not very long. Uh, life expectancy usually was somewhere in the 40s. Children of the serfs would always inherit the debt of their parents. And so we have this continuation of serf, followed by serf, followed by serf. Well, I had said at day one that in the 800s, the Dark Ages would come to an end. And one of the reasons why the Dark Ages came to an end was because of trade. People would leave one duchy and go to another duchy, and they would trade items. The raid of the Vikings and the Magyars and the the Moors were beginning to be less and less frequent, and this allowed for safe travel. There were new innovations. The horse was being replaced by the plow, by the oxen. The oxen could pull more. Uh, the, plowers, the plows were heavier. They might have a, a metal face as opposed to a, a, a wood face. And they could cut deeper. We're also going to see the abandonment of the two-field system for the three-field system. Now again, in field one, it's going to be fallow. In group in field 
the next field we're going to grow a crop and in the third field we're going to grow a different crop and then we'll switch off so let's say in field one we see where the crop being grown in the picture is wheat and then in number two it's barley and then in number three it's fallow and that's where the animals graze now next year field one might be grass field two might be wheat field three might be barley and we continue this year after year after year serfs in many cases were even given their freedom if they could move to an uninhabited area make it productive and settle the lands in many cases this small portion of the land was given to the serfs so so let's say that the king has given a vassal a hundred acres but most of the acres are covered by um, oh let's say woods so the vassal makes a deal with the serfs that if the serfs will cut down all of the trees that the serfs can have a couple maybe an acre or two here or an acre or two there and they can do on that land what whatever they want and this was a godsend for many of the serfs many of the freed serfs would take up a skill a trade now these were goods that were needed to be shipped from one part of Europe to the other. The trade routes would go from the eastern, in many cases, would go to the eastern Roman Empire. The Italians took a lead in the buying and selling of goods. There are what we call trade fairs. Now the traders would meet in a central location and they would barter for one good or another. So let's say you're from Dutch EA you go to a trade fair in Dutch EB, you might be able to have some of the things that you have in great quantities in trade for some of the things that you may not have in great quantities. But barter system is always tough. It would be better if we had money, but carrying around a large sum of money was always risky. So because of this, banks were created. Now, in a bank, you would have people's money and the bank would exchange the lord of one's coin for the lord of another and all of this was done on paper it's not like we're going to physically take a sack of gold from bank a to a bank b we're just simply going to say from bank a that we are giving you a piece of paper for x amount of dollars now these papers going back and forth became known as checks and that's what we still call them today Banks became very profitable, and banks began to loan out money. As more and more people developed skills, guilds were built. Now, a guild is a collection of like-minded craftsmen, so we're all metal workers, or we're all masons. Each of the guilds would, de would develop uniform prices, so if you want me to fix this piece of metal, it's going to cost you this much money and if you go to the guy next door he's going to charge you the same amount each of the gills was responsible for the education of new people now artisans would have to join a guild if they wish to do business so let's say you're a metal worker you would have to go to a particular guild of a particular area and you would have to join there would probably be a fee you would have to show that you could do the skill and if you could do all that, then you could become part of that guild. Now, new people were considered apprentices. The apprentice would sign a contract for a particular number of years. He would work with the craftsman. The craftsman would agree to teach the trade to the apprentice. And the apprentice would serve the craftsman for that particular amount of time. Well, at the end of that time period, the contract had been fulfilled. The apprentice would show to the guild that he understood his, his trade. If the guild agreed, then the, the apprentice could go and go to other guilds to, to become a journeyman, and he would continue his craft. If his craft skills were worthy, maybe as he got older, he could have his own apprentice. Well, I think this would be a good place for us to stop